So just a brief overview that my background is uh, this, and I'm entering my sixth year as a conservation planner with the Whatcom Conservation District. Previous to that, I was at the King Conservation District for a year and it's a really amazing network of agencies which provide free and confidential services to historically rural landowners, especially those who are farming in order to create a more sustainable use of public resources like water, soil, plants, that type of thing. And so here you can see kind of a array of services that are offered by conservation districts and in particular by the Whatcom Conservation District. Many of them, there's one in almost every county in the nation and many of them are broken down by county lines, although there are some that cover a few counties. And many of them share programming or have programming in common, but depending on your climate, there'll be a different set of programs that are applicable. So what you're seeing here is some things that are really important in our wet winter climate um, and all offered by Whatcom Conservation District. And this is a really neat collaboration, better ground of 12 districts that all share ecology. So they're able to share best management practices and resources and a sh have a shared message about how we're living around the Puget Sound Basin. And I'm gonna take a moment here. Hopefully you've all been entering into the chat what it is that you're hoping to take away from this presentation. So if you haven't done that, please visit the chat and let us know what you're hoping to take away today. Otherwise, if you could look to the poll on your screen and let us know what county are you farming in? And this should be, um, ideally it's also where you're residing, but yeah, what county? So looks like so far, I'm gonna say majority. Wow, this is like an even split. Interesting. And there's 25% other, which we don't have a what is the other. In fact, others getting bigger, 33%, 37. So not to overdo the chat, but if you want to throw into the chat what county, if it's an other, that would be interesting. And then the next question that will help us understand a little bit better our audience is, have you ever worked with a conservation district before? And so this is an even split, about 50-50. And then folks who have pigs currently are outnumbered by folks who do not currently have pigs. Interesting, okay. One thing that's really wonderful about the Conservation District Best Management Practice concept is it's applicable to all livestock and to all type of land management. So I think everybody should be able to get something out of the presentation. All right, I'm gonna move on. Krina, did you wanna share the results? I don't know, just take a moment, let the return it or I can't share the results because I closed the screen without losing the results. Perfect. Well, we, no, I talked sorry. you through it. So you, you got the okie dokie. So the, again, best management practices. So this is a sort of a jargon, if you will, that's used by the conservation districts and also by the USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service, which is a sister agency, if you will, to conservation districts, a federal arm that does similar work and so when you're working with a conservation planner we will often just have you know these broad strokes concepts a checklist if you will that we're going down in our mind when we're walking around with you or talking with you to say well do you have a manure storage and a composting facility that's just something in our climate that if you're state-of-the-art you know cutting edge farming or just trying to responsibly raise livestock or do it well, you're gonna have this. And if you're saying no, then the creative part comes in designing one that works for you because each farm is gonna be slightly different and you're the only one who knows your farm. So this is the collaboration is we come with this checklist and you come knowing yourself and we 
start collaborating. Right. And so, so let's start talking about the specific practices. So again, when I start to talk with a client, I really want to know your goals because we don't want you to build something that you're really not interested in maintaining. Um, what is the design specific to your site and your animals and your ability to manage and maintain what is going to be built? And then down to the install of that practice. So um, the first one I'm going to talk about is a heavy use area or sacrifice area. And in the Pacific Northwest, because of how much rain we get, pastures, animals on pasture all through the winter, there's, if you're, if you're not in a high and dry sandy soil type, you're really going to have concerns with soil compaction, um, grass stops growing. And so if your animals are out there eating it all winter long, making it shorter and shorter, each of those blades is, is like a little solar panel. And the more that you eat that grass down, the less energy uh, it will be able to collect come spring when the soil warms up to regrow. So to balance that, we try and, um, we promote heavy use areas or what's called sacrifice areas. And Every animal needs a different amount of space. Um, this is not a one, it's not one size fits all. Um, so that's something we really consider. What type of animal do you have? Do you have a big horse? Do you have a small horse? Do you have a horse that paces a lot? Um, things, those are, these are all things to consider. Every, even every horse is different or every breed of cow could have different considerations. Um, the soil type, the space that you're putting this heavy use area on, if it's a well-drained soil, then maybe we don't have to think about subsurface water management, but if you're on a really heavy clay, what are some drainage practices that might go along with this heavy use area so that you're not just creating a, a swimming pool where animals are still standing in water? Um, and again, what are your chore goals? What's that footing material going to be? How, how often are you able to clean it out? Would you rather pick with a fork or do you have a tractor implement that you go in and you scrape off the surface? Every, every site is different. And this is what we're really interested to work with you to make sure we're designing something that you want to use. Um, so here's the first uh, kind of case study we're doing. Um, the picture on the right is the before. So they bought the property in August, thought they were buying this high and dry, beautifully sloped for drainage um, field. And turns out there were two springs in the hillside that showed up um, that fall. So um, not as great as they thought it was gonna be. And so we worked with them to figure out how many, since they had just bought the property, how many horses did they, did they want to have long-term? Um, where, I mean, they had a blank slate. Where did they want their manure storage? Did it need to have access to, um, did, does it need to have tractor access? Um, what type of footing material does their horse, do they want their horse to be standing on? So they had three horses. Um, they went with a smaller, um, air, square footage for those heavy use areas, only 500 square feet, but it's because their horses are being ridden or exercised daily. Um, so they were okay with that smaller space. Um, and then they really wanted a one and done construction. They wanted to put the money in up front and have it be something that lasts and that there's not a lot of maintenance. You know, is that it. 500 square feet per animal or total? Yeah. Five, 500 square feet per horse. And Definitely. how many horses again? There was three horses. Okay. Yeah. So 1,500 yeah. square feet is their target. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. So this heavy use area um, ended up costing them about $1,500. We usually estimate that it's 500. It's, we usually estimate about a dollar per square foot um, when we work with folks and so they excavated out the topsoil this is a really important step if you have a lot of mud 
Mud is the mixture of that organic matter in your soil. It's the mixture of the manure being left on the surface. And so really clearing off that topsoil um, to get down to the mineral soil. And every site is different. Um, usually we go out there and, um, or you go out there and you take a shovel and dig down and see what, what it is your soil profile looks like in this area. So they scraped off um, about 10 inches of material. They put down construction grade filter fabric. And what that does is it keeps your mineral soil in the bottom and keeps it from mixing with all this material that you're putting onto the surface. If you have a horse that digs, you're either going to be considering increased amount of material that you're putting on the filter fabric, or we'll talk about um, alternatives to filter fabric uh, because you don't just want to spend all that money and have it come to the surface really soon. Um, so this is, they did filter fabric and then they did six inches of compacted five eighths minus um, and that gives a solid sub base um, they didn't have to do much as far as slope regrading because they were already on a slope so everything is naturally draining towards us in that photo uh, but that is something you really want to consider if you are Installing a heavy use area, you don't just want to dig yourself a swimming pool. You want to make sure that there's an outlet where that water can um, naturally flow, um, slope away. And for them, it was really important that it sloped towards us in the photo and not to the right side of the photo because there was um, a swale to the right that we didn't want the manure from the heavy use area going towards. And so you can see these are the after photos. Um, they, after the 5 eighths minus, they just put down another um, layer of clear gravel so it doesn't have the fines and doesn't compact. And that was their top. Um, and this is five months of use. She picks the manure daily. There's not a lot of waste hay, but there is some. And you, you do still get the look because it's not a covered area completely you do still get what looks like mud but it's really just on the surface and you can see looking at those horses hooves that it's not very deep it's like a sun maybe not even an inch deep and so your horses are still able to stay stay on this dry space and for chores you're still not you're not mucking through um, losing your boots um, and then you can see the way they did their three shelters um, behind the heavy use areas. So next slide, oops. Um, so here's a great, um, some other examples. That was just one heavy use area. This is another one that we installed on the top right is the quick cows. Question, sorry, quick question, Karina, before yeah. you move on. I wanted to know, there's a question in the chat, if the cost for that heavy use area, which was relatively small, did that include them hiring tractor work done for that site prep or did they own a tractor and that they cost was tractor. just materials? Nope, they hired a tractor. That cost was materials and the tractor rental for the weekend. So, okay, they didn't hire an operator. They operated yeah. and that was an equipment rental and materials. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. um, they, her father-in-law um, knows how to operate a tractor. So they just had to rent. I don't even think they rented it for a weekend. It might've been a one day, a one day rental. Um, Great. Yeah, and, and a lot of times, and this is that's a huge one is renting a tractor that price can vary so much depending on how far you are away from the rental company like if you're really far out in the county it might cost more um so there's just so many variables in these projects that aren't always that we always we can't estimate ahead of time um so part of the application process is figuring all that out, um, contacting a rental company, doing all these estimates so that we can make sure we're um, able to fund enough of your project. Um, so again, this uh, heavy use area on the top right, that is a, a herd of 15 beef cows, um, Herefords and 
what they he did a bit creatively uh, put construction concrete debris on the bottom. So he has no filter fabric. Um, he dug down like over a foot, almost two feet and really filled it in with just a lot of large concrete rubble. Um, and then inside of that filled with um, five eighths minus all the way to the surface to create a very solid platform. Um, he did this with us about 15 years ago and he keeps changing it over time. And I was at his farm on uh, Tuesday this week and he had added even more material to it. So every year or every two years or more, he is coming back in and, and topping off that gravel and recompacting it. And his cows, you know, it kind of looks a little muddy out there, but still when you look at their hooves, their hides are clean and their hooves are um, barely in, they're only less than an inch deep in, in the mud. So, and he has a great, um, because he knows that it's always wet around the base because there is no roof, uh, he puts in these, um, he puts in these piles of hog fuel. It's got a base of rock underneath it. So it's just a top dressing of hog fuel. And that's where the cows can go sit, lay down, or um, I guess lay down and stand uh, in the sun and be, be dry. So, and he runs around with a tractor with a box blade on it and uh, scrapes all that manure into the pile in the foreground. So his design had the manure storage in the same, in the same fenced area. So, and then the photo below is Robin Propes. She um, wanted a much bigger area for her, her horses and she hand walks, she walks them to, to the paddocks in the day and then walks them back to the barn at night so they're not attached. It's more time on her part, but she enjoys it. She's retired. Um, and the design was a scrape off the topsoil, put down um, filter fabric and cover it. I think she ended up using pea gravel on the surface of that one. So, and this photo on the left, there are, there are so many different options for what you can top your heavy use areas with. Um, it's an, usually animal specific, but also your preference. Um, and this is, and we do have available a footing option, material options handout, and it breaks down the cost, the durability, um, of all these different materials in that photo. Um, okay, the next slide. So another practice that goes with um, heavy use areas or anyone that has a shelter for their animal is roof water management. It might not seem like a lot, but depending on where you are in the county, we can get so much rain, it really varies. You can see it in this photo. Um, just, you know, city to city, it, it varies. Um, so when we talk about roof water management, it's is your gutter or is your roof draining into where your animals are trying to walk in and out of the barn? Is it causing a lot of deep mud? Is it facing away from the heavy use area. So maybe it's really not that much of a concern if it's just on grass where your animals aren't. Um, so what is the impact that this roof water uh, is having on your site? We look at the size of your roof. We look at the rainfall that you get specific to your area based on um, local information. We look at um, what type of barn you have and what type of gutter would be suited for it. Some of the really large dairy barns that are getting gutters, they're getting, um, they get a completely different style of gutter than you would put on, um, than you would put on maybe a smaller barn or, or shed. Um, so, and then another piece of that is now that you've collected all this water off your roof, what are you going to do with it? Where are you going to outlet it? Do you have to put a pipe in the ground for a long ways to get it away? from where your animals are in the winter? Do you have the soil type that you could um, move it just a little ways away from the barn and then actually infiltrate it, whether it's a dry well or an infiltration trench? Um, and this is a cross section of a drawing that um, 
our engineer put together that shows the three structures and then shows the amount of fall they needed um, for the very long pipe that they opted into to really get the mover, get the water completely away from their farmstead. So I'm gonna go through a couple projects now. Um, so this one you can see um, just over 3000 square feet of roof and for their area, um, that almost 50,000 gallons of water was redirected. And for their operation, they have a very high density of animals on only three acres. And so making sure that those fields are dry because they want to maximize their use in the winter, that was the driving factor behind spending almost 5,000, just over $4,000 on gutters and underground outlets, because that's huge. That's a lot of money. Um, but their goals and priorities lined up with, with investing that much. Um, and so gutters estimate at around $4 a foot, but the underground outlet, what you can see in that middle photo, that really just depends on how far you're going, what your soil type is, and um, where you can get your pipe from. That price is, is so variable, it's hard to estimate. Um, but, and sometimes we can, it makes sense to run the pipe underground, like you can see here, and other times, uh, we have worked with people that actually run the pipe along their building um, out above ground so that you're not having to dig. You're just supporting the pipe along the side of your barn. Um, I guess let me go back just a second. So, and, and like I said, sometimes you don't have the soil type that could take that much water up and you have to pipe it as far as you can or as far as you need to. Um, and other times, uh, you know, you can get it away from your barn enough to an area where your animals aren't in the winter. And that's where we would recommend an infiltration trench or a dry well. It's just really important to think about when you're doing an infiltration trench or a dry well, that's kind of a direct conduit to, um, to potentially to groundwater. So it's really important that those areas are protected from being contaminated with manure. You wanna make sure if you're using dry well or an infiltration trench that there's no manure inputs also going down that, um, and it's just the gutter water. Um, so just wanted to mention that. Um, another common, common practice um, is fence. And every animal, again, needs a different fence. Um, and it's animal landowner preference. Um, we try and review, as with the gutters as well and other practices we recommend, we try and review on an annual basis the cost of all these practices and adjust them when we're doing our estimates um, and doing our, when we calculate how much we can help you pay for with the cost share. Um, and, you know, the photo on the bottom, they assumed that their animals, there was enough blackberries in between that the animals weren't getting through and then found that there was actually a small little path that they were managing to get through. And um, you can see the manure pile right there next to the creek. And so the fencing that we can help pay for through our cost share is very specific to animal exclusion. Um, so the fence in the bottom photo is a five foot tall no climb um, to keep goats and alpacas um, in. And sometime, And we can talk to you about whether we're gonna pay for uh, actually, I think it's in my next slide. Um, but yeah, every every animal and landowner has a different preference for fencing, and we can work with you to help design something um, that works for your site. And um, the above photo is Don Hooford. He's our ninety. -year He's the one that had those cattle um, in the heavy use area a few slides back. And he's ninety years old, and his preference is to put up and take down his fences every single year 
and um, his cattle respect a single hotline um, on that step in post that you see. So, um, yeah, so fencing can be permanent, it can be temporary, it's how it fits your operation. Um, fencing for horses, also every landowner has a different preference. Um, there's the fence on the left is, I think it's called poly rope. It's the rope or rope braid. Um, they just use two strands of it. They use, they prefer wooden fence posts. So they do an H brace on each end. And then um, they had a wood fence post every 20 feet, which might be kind of far. I think they were definitely pushing the distance between posts, but they have horses that um, respect that. And then this other client, they used, um, they found a farm that went out of business and had all these metal posts. So they, they're what you would see on like a chain link fence and they used that for their posts and then, um, smooth wire, um, electric smooth wire between all that. So fencing varies. We know that, um, we also support you using reused materials as long as it's not a post that has already started to rot, um, like using these metal posts that are going to continue to last. And that was a heavy use area that they also installed with funding from us a few years ago. Um, on the very large, on a very large scale, each of those um, paddocks I think is almost a thousand square feet, uh, but their horses aren't getting ridden as often and the rest of their land is pretty much underwater through winter. So they wanted to make sure they had a big enough space. Um, for, cause it's almost six months of the year that those horses are there when they're not being ridden. So. Um, here's one that we paid for that was 1200 feet of fence for beef. So it's, uh, it's hard to see in the photo, but it's five, four or five strand barbed wire. Um, with a single strand of hot tape across the top. Um, and uh, there's the kind of the breakdown of materials. Again, it's hard to see, but as part of this, you did get access to um, the PDF of this PowerPoint. Uh, but they did all the labor themselves um, and it ended up being about $2.50 per foot. Um, so this is about $3,000 um, for all that fencing. And that fence is, it's permanent, but what it is is it's dividing seasonal access. So on the left side of that fence is where the cows and they have Clydesdales are not in the winter. It's the buffer um, along the stream that's in those trees. And then the field on the right is where they um, want to pasture their animals in the winter. They have enough fields down below to do rotational grazing that the impact that their animals are having on this grass, they don't mind that they're losing forage. Um, and it is a really rocky, dry soil. So it's not, um, there's not a lot of mud out there. And, but you can see it's definitely uh, quite overgrazed for if they were trying to manage that for forage production. So. So manure storage, another, if you have animals, you have manure. Um, and again, every animal produces a different amount of manure and every animal has a different amount of bedding or maybe even waste feed. Um, like if you're trying to feed goats, there's there can be quite a bit of waste feed. Um, so that's all taken into account as part of the calculation to figure out what is a realistic cubic yardage that of space that you want to maintain um, for you know three months to six months to do you do you only want to export once a year maybe you need 12 months of storage so and then siting your manure storage is another really important one tractor access do you want it next to your garden so you fill it up but then you just empty it into your garden that's right next door or right um, adjacent um, 
you want it to be at least a hundred feet away from wetlands, other surface water. If you have a well on your property that's pretty shallow, there's a sanitary setback that's recommended potentially up to 200 feet. So um, those are things we want to think about when we're planning manure storage. Um, if you have a herd of cows with looser stool than looser manure, something to think about is do you need to slope that slab at the bottom to keep all the liquids contained or is it a drier horse manure and you can have a um, flat slab. So yeah, things to think about. Um, so you, and manure storage can vary across the board. Um, you know, in terms of how much money do you wanna put into it to store poop or can you find some pallets and put together something or is it as simple as just a pile on the ground with a tarp over the top of it? But the most important thing is your manure is full of nutrients. And so tarping your pile in the winter not only helps keep it drier so that it can start to compost and break down, but it's also, it keeps the nutrients in your pile. It doesn't let them leach through to the ground and it doesn't, um, they aren't running off with the rainwater that's flowing through. Because if you're taking the time to collect all this manure, you have these nutrients, this fertilizer that you can use on your own fields, whether it's your own pastures or your gardens, or if you have friends that are coming over to get it. Um, if you are collecting it, it's a great, it's not a waste product. It's a fertilizer that you can be using on your field. So collect it and then use it. And we have, Whatcom Conservation District has a manure spreader. I know Snohomish does, King County does, I think Thurston and maybe Pierce do as well. So if you're in a different county, um, it's worth checking out to see if they have one. And ours is a two and a half cubic yard ground driven. We chose the smaller size so that if you don't have a tractor, you can put it on your ATV, you can put it on your truck. Um, we wanted something that was really versatile. Um, so, okay, that's my, <laughs> that's my manure spreader um, bit, but back to manure storage. Um, so again, um, so many different options for manure storage. I'm going to go through just a few of them, but um, this is some clients we worked with. <laughs> I saw Tristan a few weeks ago and she said, that's an expensive toilet. It is an expensive toilet if you look at it that way, but the long term of it also, their goals again was year round access, durable enough that they have a tractor, that they can turn the pile, that they are exporting through winter. So they need to be able to access it and um, year round with their tractor to get to load trucks. Um, also, we're concerned about their, their new with using a tractor. So, you know, that they wanted something that could take the bumps <laughs> when they would be hitting it. Um, and this is a prefab concrete bunker. Normally, these brackets, these L brackets that are making up the, the back walls and the side walls, are, they're normally vertical and you see them on dairy farms holding all the silage. So these are just repurposed um, dairy barn silage bunker L's set on their side. They're four feet tall. Um, so you've got a lot of, it's the equivalent of two ecology blocks. They didn't go with ecology blocks because they didn't feel like they had the space to lose the two foot width of each block. Um, and then these were also prefab slabs. So um, it's a four cubic yard capacity uh, total if they fill it to the top. Um, and the prep for the site was they had the tractor there for um, clearing out their heavy use area. So they scraped a little square. They poured some sand on top of it um, as the base. And then the boom truck came with all the pieces and um, they took them two hours to drop it into place. And they had a, and they had a 
bunker ready to go. They were thinking about doing forms and pouring their own concrete, but if you start to calculate that you have to pour the slab, let it cure, and then come in and create the forms for the walls and then pour them and let them cure, it wasn't enough concrete from the truck. So you'd have to pay for a whole truckload, but then only use half of it. And then you'd have to pay for a whole truckload again, only to use half of it. So it just didn't calculate out for them to do a pour in place um, for manure storage. So the prefab slabs and the sidewalls, while expensive, they decided um, fit their needs the best. Karina, can you address how they're going to be covering that pile to keep it from getting saturated and going anaerobic? Are they going to tarp or? Yeah. Um, so he is putting eyelets along the outside of the bunker um, into that upper wall and then um, secure and then he'll be tying the tarp to those eyelets. Cool. Thank Whether you. that will be long lasting enough, yeah. um, sometimes a single point of attachment, even a lot of them, the wind still gets underneath and can rip it out. Um, what you I could you could think about would be um, rolling the tarp over or around something like a two by four, and then securing that um, to the outside walls, just so there's no wind coming up and underneath. Um, let me see, two slides before, oh, here we go. Um, here's some examples of other covered ones. Um, this, the one in the middle, they live next door to a dairy facility. So they were able to get some old tires um, that they use to secure secure the tarp down because she gets a really bad northeaster through there. Um, the thing to think about with this, if you're using just tires, if you're using old tires, a lot of times they'll fill with water or mice will make their homes in them. So that's why you see all these tires that have been cut and the wires have also been taken out so that, um, cause there's wire inside of tire, which, um, and so you don't want that ripping, ripping your, tarp um, and then this other one on the left it's hard to see but they rolled the base of it along the front under a two by four so that when they come by with their um every day when they come by to put add their manure to it they just lift up one corner of the two by four and then it's like a big drape the whole thing um or enough opens up that they can get their uh wheelbarrow in there so um yeah, some different different options for those eco blocks. Um, so let's see. Okay, I think I did everything for that. And um, so another manure storage option is uh, I call it, I'm going to call it the DIY kit. Um, their goals are ease of access to both load and unload. They really wanted an accelerated compost time without the manual labor associated with turning a pile. Um, and they wanted a product that was weed free and could be used on the gardens on their property. So they have five llamas, two goats, they're boarding four horses and three oxen. They have a very large family garden. So lots of animals and they didn't want a really big manure storage. So there's a pile of their manure spreader that they have, or there's a picture of the manure spreader they have, the pile that they used to have, um, even bigger than the manure spreader. And then also another photo of um, where they were storing their pile previously and um, you can just see how wet and saturated it is and just not, not ease of access and potentially with that much saturation, if there's a concentrated runoff occurring from that pile would be something we would look at. So this is what they put together. Um, they paid $700 for the design from O2 composting. Um, it came with instructions on how to build and um, add the air forced aeration. 
and then they went and collected on all the materials to build it themselves. Um, they did use a contractor initially. I wish I had added a photo for that, but I didn't. Um, they did use a contractor initially to dig out the hillside. So you can see that it's kind of set into the hillside. The middle photo um, shows the, the like toe of that ecology ball ecology block wall and the slope of the path next to it. Um, and so, and then you have in between the ecology block wall and all those different bunkers, you have a Rubbermaid tote with your forced air fan and PV, four inch PVC pipe that is pushing air through the base of each one of those um, storage bins. And so the forced air composting, Katie's gonna talk about a lot more um, in her aerated compost talk at one o'clock. Um, but this one is, yeah, forced air. So they load one, one bin up and then uh, once it's full, they move on to the next bin. And then um, by the time they get to the third bin, the first bin is almost ready and they can unload it um, and, and use it into their garden. And with this, the, <clears throat> the pile has re it's covered and the forced air, it's reached that 130 or so degrees um, for enough time to kill the weed seeds. So, and the, um, those concrete blocks in the bottom are to protect the PVC pipes so that when they go to unload the bin, they're not breaking um, that structure at the bottom and you probably just have to use um, manure fork or something to clean out the last of it at the end. So, um, yeah, and these can be made in all different sizes. Um, we have someone that just did a two bin and they've done a three bin and Katie is planning one um on a her pig farm that's going to be 50 by 75 feet so these are very scalable um and their total cost for this three bin one was five thousand dollars okay and um so eco blocks are the concrete lego um and they weigh a lot. Uh, they are two feet wide, so it's definitely a consideration to take in when you're thinking about space. Um, so this eco block storage was built. They wanted, um, oh, I should mention the previous slide, they load those bins from the top. They made ramps when I was talking about ease of, um, ease of acts of loading, they made ramps that go along the top. And so they dump into the bin and then they load out from the bottom. Um, so that's something to think about when you're loading and when you're designing uh, manure storage. And that's what this person is doing as well. They set it into the hillside so that they could load from the top. Um, so you can pile your manure to its highest capacity without having a tractor that's pushing it up <clears throat> constantly. Um, so ecology blocks, this, they wanted it closer to the barn. They have four horses and their goal was 42 cubic yards of storage for the manure, the bedding and the waste hay. Um, and here's an example drawing of what you can put together to calculate size. Um, it's really important with ecology blocks that you interlock the blocks, you alternate. Um, if you stack two just on top of each other and you're using a tractor, you're more likely to push them over. So they gain a lot of their strength by offsetting the blocks when you're building them. So they come in four foot blocks and they also come in two by twos. Um, and so this is a great example of them being interlocked. If you go higher than two blocks because you have a tractor that has the ability to stack it higher, that's great. But what you're gonna wanna consider is um, stability. Above two blocks high, it's no longer considered stable. So what you have to do is um, cover that bottom block with um, fill behind it. 
So you're stabilizing that bottom block. So then it becomes again, looking like a two block structure. So if you're looking at it from the outside, you wouldn't even see that bottom block. You would just see the two. So anything higher than two blocks, you're gonna wanna factor in more stability. Um, so next. So here's some finished or some in progress photos of that ecology block manure storage. Um, they dug it out. We don't normally um, recommend filter fabric underneath it, uh, but that was something this person wanted to do. Um, it's, if you're gonna do a, if you do a concrete base, it's really durable. When you're in there with the tractor clearing it out, you're not grabbing any of the gravel. Um, for this one, you do have to be more careful about when you're cleaning out the pile, making sure that you're not just digging out all that material that you brought in. This is phase one for them. They, in the first year, just wanted to get the blocks up. They put down this compacted gravel base. And the second year, they're gonna actually pour a slab um, in between the concrete blocks so that in the future when they use their tractor, they're not digging it out. Um, and this, and the, the thing with ecology blocks too is it's very, the, the cost of the block is about $25 each. But what gets you is if you live right next to the facility where they're making the blocks, there's not a lot of trucking costs. But if you live across the county from where they're making these blocks, all of a sudden trucking can get really expensive because not only do they have to bring, bring the truck, they also bring the boom because they have to place the blocks for you um, unless you have a tractor of your own. Um, but most of the time these are heavy enough that you need a significantly sized tractor or you're just gonna, you're gonna need the boom. So she lives pretty close to the, the yard where the blocks came from. So pretty, re I mean, expensive toilet, but maybe more reasonably expensive toilet at $1,800. And then since she was bringing in all the base material for that um, manure storage, she decided to improve her, um, she ended up just buying a whole truck of the gravel and um, ended up redoing her heavy use areas as well. So we only did cost share with her on the manure storage and then she um, took advantage of that truck delivery cost and went ahead and um, installed heavy use areas for her, her I think four horses. Um, okay, so here's another example of the ecology block. The reason this one is so much more expensive is because they're significantly farther away from the yard that had the ecology blocks. So, um, and they also, something you can see is those concrete runners that are on the surface, they actually buried those in. You can't, can't really see it, it's in front of the tractor, but they buried them into the gravel. And so that's the skid that their tractor bucket is running on so that they're not removing the gravel base they put down. So this is a great alternative to pouring a concrete base if you wanna um, just do gravel, putting in these, they're like the parking strip um, bumper things, um, putting those down um, is a great, great alternative. Um, and they wanted a two bay, but they didn't wanna lose the two feet to the ecology block. So they used treated materials and it's not quite finished, but they, and they um, reinforced the, those treated two by fours with another post on this side. And like I said, covering, covering a pile, um, it's really up to you. Here's one of the tarps that we um, gave away, gave them. Um, so whatever scrap lumber and rocks they had lying around is how they covered it. So next slide, I'm almost done. This is, this is going on a long time, but, um, and then of course, you know, pile it on the ground. It doesn't cost anything. There's no infrastructure. Uh, this person is doing, um, they started farther away from their barn and basically made themselves a log of manure and bedding and waste hay that they've covered with the tarp. And it is 
directly adjacent to their garden. So come spring, um, although it kind of looks like it's spring in this photo with those flowers, but um, come garden season when it's appropriate, they open up the pile and then they just drag it into their garden right there um, and, and use it. So um, yeah, so there are lots of different options for manure storage, complete range of costs. Um, some people just, you know, take time and gather materials slowly and put something together. It's more of just the important piece is where are you placing it? How are you accessing it? You really don't want to place it somewhere that you then can't get to because you're collecting all these nutrients. It's, it's in your benefit to use them on your fields or in your gardens. Um, so, and just last, last slide, I think. Um, like I talked about, we have a small cost share, this small cost share grant, this um, family used it to improve their heavy use area, build themselves a pretty large bunker adjacent to that heavy use area. They also installed gutters, but additionally, they enrolled in our CREP Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program. It's a habitat restoration program that um, plants trees along creeks, trees and shrubs along fish bearing creeks or streams and wetlands. And so they, in that lower picture, hopefully it's big enough, you can see the cows and you can see the brand new fence. So CREP not only installs the plants, but if you have animals, they also pay to install a fence to keep your animals out of the CREP buffer. And in this one, they already had some sort of buffer between them and the stream, but they decided um, they just wanted to improve it more and extend that buffer out even further. And so this is, the fence goes in first and then they plant it. So this is a photo of the fence built and then that um, winter, the plants were going to be um, planted. So it's a, you know, we have lots of programs and our goal is to try and connect you if you need it with as many of them as you're interested in. There's no double dipping. You can, we encourage you to look into all the options that um, we offer. So that was, I feel like a lot of information. I talked for, <laughs> talked for a long time. Um, if you have questions, uh, I didn't put my email, but there's my cell phone number that you can reach me at where, um, and I can put my email in the chat box. And are there any questions? Hi, Karina. There was questions about composting, a lot of questions about composting. So I'm sending people to the 1 p.m. aerated composting class. Um, for example, Ashley was wondering with the manure and bedding piles that we're talking about, is, it, is there a need to stir the pile? That's the direct question. Um, there's no need to stir the pile unless you want it to compost faster. Um, manure will break down if you leave it in a pile long enough, but if you don't want the pile to be there for a year, um, stirring it, if you've got a manure fork or a tractor is, <laughs> tractor is always easier, um, stirring it uh, every other week is great. Um, if you have a, the ability to build up one pile and stir that and then start a new pile while the one is cooking, that is really the, the best method for the, for the fastest breakdown, I guess, um, if you don't have aeration. Uh, if you want it, if you don't want to stir the pile, but you do want some aeration, you can take uh, PVC pipes, drill a bunch of holes in them, and stuff them into the pile or place them in the bottom and then fill in on top of it. And what that does is it um, allows air to get into the center of the pile um, but it, it's not forced, so it's not as fast, but it still definitely helps in that process. Um, so I know one of the bigger stables that we worked with, um, they do like a windrow style 
manure pile, they start on one end of the slab and they start piling it up. And every once in a while, they stick a pipe into it that's got all these holes. And then they keep on piling down. They keep piling their manure down the slab. Um, so it's, it's a pretty interesting sight to see this pile with all the different um, pipes coming out of it. But that's how they do it so that they don't have to mix. Um, and it usually is, I think they're exporting from the about every five or six months for breakdown. And I was just going to reiterate, there was a question in the chat about attending the aerated compost or, you know, what if you have another class at the same time? And my understanding is that the links to every single one of the classes are going to be available to all of us. Um, excuse me, the recordings, the links to recordings of the classes within a week or two after this amazing event that WSU is putting on, they're going to create a website, WSU website, where we'll be able to go back and watch recordings of anything that was missed. 